Uh, please join me in welcome our first advisory council, the Scientific Advisory Council, or SAC for short. So representing the council today, I have uh, David Taylor, Gavin Thomas, Caldeb Dave, and Adriano Kio is going to be joining us uh, virtually. And I take this chance to, to say hi to our virtual forum out there, okay? Hi. Are we, are we on? Okay. Yeah, we are. Thank you, Pablo. Um, hi, my name is Dave, uh, David Taylor. I am the VP of Research and Strategic Partnerships at ALS Society of Canada. And I have been the chair for quite a while now. It was actually five years ago, uh, just under five years ago, that it was Rachel Patterson and Steve Bell asked about forming council. And uh, we have a quick ceremonial piece right here off the bat. So I just wanted to quickly say a big thank you to Hort Jan for being somebody that really championed the formation of this, and, and from myself as well, uh, Andrea, who was also a board li liaison, uh, Pablo, who's always been a big champion of the SAC as well, Kalani for uh, em embracing it as the, ch the chair coming in when this was started, and, and all the council members for allowing me to have this role over the past four and a half years, and, and for joining on this, of such a a great uh, privilege for me. And um, I'm really excited to see where it will go next in uh, the next several years. You know, there were a lot of ambition at the start and you always hope when something new comes along, you're gonna take it as far as your ambitions will go. But I'm really excited that it will be going there in, in the near future. And I have a lot of opinions and I, I like my opinions, but I also think that there's room for new opinions. And actually, I just missed Kathy. Thank you so much to Kathy as well. Um, you know, um, but speaking of those opinions, I think a lot of our calls over the years and stuff, long calls, have permeated where we are now. And so I think it's so important that we pass that over and see what a new chair can bring to the SAC and the ambitions moving forward. So it's a privilege and a pleasure to ceremoniously pass over the chairpersonship to my friend, Gethin Thomas, and uh, that's it for me. So over to you, Gethin. All right, thank you, Dave, and uh, thank you to the Alliance for um, uh, choosing me as the uh, next chair of the SAC. And now that I'm chair and Dave's not the chair, I'm gonna say a few words about David because I know he's gonna hate it, but tough luck, because you're not the chair anymore. So, um, it's an extremely scary proposition taken over from David as the chair. Um, I suspect there is no one out there with such a deep knowledge of MND and ALS. He's, he is easily the world's biggest ALS nerd by a long stretch. And further, he's also a fantastic advocate. And, you know, unlike most of us, he's never scared about putting his neck out there, out there on Twitter and social media. And, he's, and even when he's faced with really some quite personal uh, and unwarranted abuse, he's always respectful, always empathetic. And um, he's really got out there and he's a brilliant torchbearer for a calm and rational approach to interpreting research and clinical data. And from the SAC um, uh, perspective, look, he's done 90% of the work of the SAC. He's drafted every briefing note driven us along and uh, really helped the agenda. So, like I said, it's very scary to be stepping into, um, into his shoes, but I'd like to just give uh, a really good uh, sign of appreciation for David and a big round of applause, please. <laughs> and embarrassing for that. Okay. Okay. okay, right, let's get on with the uh, Q&A now. And I think uh, oh, we've embarrassed David enough. Um, so, um, We'll stick with the format. Basically, please, anyone out there in, um, in the audience here and out there on, um, online, please just fire in your questions. Anything uh, scientific is, is fair game, and we'd love to hear um, what your thoughts are and if you, what questions, and we'll do our best to answer them. So to start off with, I think we'll just, um, just uh, the panel will just, uh, first of all, give you uh, just an idea of uh, one thing each that we're excited about. So, um, Kodip, cool if you'd like to start. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I think I'm really excited about is the concept of prevention. Uh, this is not something that we were talking about two or three or four years ago in a, in a way that we are talking about it today. Um, 
I mean, gosh, we have our first prevention trial that's happening. Uh, that's the Atlas trial with Hafersen and SOD1 carriers. Um, you know, they, it's, a, it's a complex disease. It's um, rare, uh, relatively speaking. And, but we have some ideas around genes and environment. And the fact that we are, our field is willing to explore those ideas to um, start to think about prevention, uh, I think it's really exciting. Adriana? Uh, um, first of all, uh, thanks all for uh, having allowed me to be, to be present even if virtually. Um, and I think it's really um, a, an important uh, uh, moment for ALS. I worked on ALS in the last 30 years. Uh, we have uh, new drugs, uh, a lot of new trials, a lot of companies are interested in ALS. And that's, uh, that's really very important because uh, even if not all the trials that are ongoing uh, will be successful, uh, I think that more trials will be more possibilities. Um, and then we have a new possibility to uh, treat uh, patients with genetic ALS. Um, Tofersen was uh, uh, a good success, I mean. Um, unfortunately, uh, the ASO for um, Sinai North was not successful. But anyway, uh, even if not uh, all uh, what glitters is gold, I think uh, we are going to have uh, a really good era for the treatment of ALS. David? Yeah, actually, I would go off something that both of, uh, both of these gentlemen said, and I would actually relate it back to Tofersen a little bit. I'm very excited about what it's teaching us, and I, I feel like, for the first of all, it teaches us the importance of strong biomarkers, target engagement biomarkers that we can learn uh, about whatever it is is in trial and knowing that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, but I think, for the, I think, and this is my opinion, I guess, for the first time ever, we may be able to be, have pretty good understanding that for at least people who are progressing a little bit slow, slower, we can actually treat them after diagnosis and probably have a significant effect. And this isn't necessarily something that's in the published literature, but I think if you talk to clinicians worldwide, you know, there are people who are on this for a long time and thriving. And so that to me is heartening because it means that we have a shot when we didn't necessarily know before that if you were giving someone, putting someone in a trial after diagnosis, if it wasn't too late. So, and then we go upstream of it with mm -hmm. Atlas, and I think that's very exciting. And then what I, I think what I also really love about Tofersen, and it's not specifically anything to do other than what I think we're learning from it, is that it's forcing difficult conversations that might have lingered longer. Trial length, the ALS FRSR, something that's been talked about for a long time. Where does it fit in our outcome measures? It's probably there somewhere, but how does it fit? And then, um, you know, uh, NFL as a, as a potential surrogate marker, or, or how does that actually relate to what we have as outcome measures moving forward? These are conversations that are tricky and difficult, and I think it's forcing it upon the field, which probably is good for a disease that needs urgency. So I, I just, I feel like scientifically what we're learning from that trial is really, really exciting. Thank you, Dave. And I guess what I'm thinking about is really exciting is probably less specific, but more about the evidence we're seeing about how working in partnerships, people working together, is really starting to produce results. We see that in the UK with the United for MND. They've had a fantastic outcome there. Um, the app for ALS in the US where everyone came together and drove funding in the De Department of Defense um, funding as well. Mm -hmm. And in Australia, we're, we've been working really well with Fight MND, and we have a, a, what we call the MND Collective now, where we've got all the researchers across Australia, right across all the disciplines, talking to each other and working together to identify how we can um, stop any duplication, how we see synergies, and how we can work together, perhaps, to generate something similar to the United for MND outcome. So I think right across the world we're seeing that. The platform trials are bringing people together as well. I think it's really important that we keep that kind of collaborative um, momentum going 
And yes, there's, there's problems. Some things don't work together. A lot of the um, registries don't talk that well to each other. But I mean, going forward, you want to think about how we can make that work better. You know, get data, data scientists, whoever you need, to make sure there's there's ways that we're always thinking ahead and thinking how we can maximise use of our outcomes, our data in in the future. So that's uh, my thinking. Um, uh, we can keep talking for a long time, but uh, we'd much rather questions were coming in from the audience. I don't know if you've got any, any in the room or any online. Who's doing the online questions? Okay, cool. We also have tap dance material. We have two people over there. Okay, great. It's always Gorjana and me. <laughs> um, my question is, how can we translate the importance to the uh, clinical trials on how important it is that they reach more populations than what they are actually testing? You know, we know there, there's a lot of investigation going on in Europe, in the US, some in Asia, but then you look at Africa or South America, we're really behind. How can we translate that to the people that are doing the clinical trials so they can get our patients and they can learn about us too? Uh, yeah, I could start. I mean, I spoke about capacity yesterday. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult because, and I'll give you an example. Um, you know, in some of the regions that you mentioned, you know, there might even be a lack of standard protocols for seeing pa people with ALS, or even how DNA is collected or it may not even, there might not even be a minus 80 freezer to store the samples so that DNA can be analyzed later, right? So uh, there are some infrastructure issues that need to be resolved first uh, for those, you know, to, to have trial sites in those underrepresented areas. And that, I'm not saying that doesn't need to happen. That needs to happen, and I think that's where the Alliance has already started that conversation. And you know, how do we do that through a grant program, through you know, different uh, initiatives to try to establish that infrastructure around the world and the standardization in clinical endpoints and biological endpoints, which will then you know, hopefully make them trial sites that sponsors can go to and recruit people. Does it Anyone else have any comments on that? I don't know if Adriana wants to or? I, yeah. Oh, or I can. For sure, for sure we need to involve uh, um, uh, a lot of countries uh, and some of them are already involved. There are trials in Argentina, for example, that, which is uh, uh, particularly important for us. And uh, there is a, a reason that, which is a sort of paradox. Uh, we are doing a lot of trials in the US, Canada and Europe. And now we have a shortage of patients in, uh, in uh, these regions because uh, the number of patients that is in trial is uh, so uh, large that at the very end there are few patients for, for recruiting for new trials. So this paradox could be really very important for other countries. We are extending trials in Eastern Europe that was usually not involved in clinical trials. And we are thinking to, to, to go to Turkey uh, and, other, and other countries, uh, uh, for example, in the, in the European and Mediterranean area. But uh, uh, something that we have to do is to help uh, um, uh, neurologists uh, in uh, um, other areas uh, um, to start to reach a good clinical um, um, level uh, for doing clinical trials, which is not really easy. But I think we can have, uh, do that, uh, and uh, uh, the alliance can be very important for that. Yeah. And PACTALS as well? Yep, exactly. Yeah, PACTALS also can play a, a really a key role in distributing the, um, yeah. uh, the trials on a wider basis. I think that's a very good point that um, Adriano makes about basically uh, there's a, not enough patients probably in the, the westernized countries at the moment to keep feeding the trial pipeline. There's a lot, hopefully more phase three trials will be coming through after, and they have to be larger. So uh, we definitely need to work on that. And perhaps an expansion in the, um, the criteria for inclusion as well will help. I mean, certainly the Lighthouse 2 trial has quite broad inclusion criteria, so you'd help that. 
perhaps that could help also to um, expand the trials and perhaps make it easier to recruit in, in other countries as well. Yeah. Can I add? One of Please. our colleagues on the SAC, Janine Hackman, is also really pushing for trying to, and it will take time, but evolving Africa and having a few sites in Africa that can evolve to multidisciplinary care and eventually getting to you know, the potential for trials and, and for research there. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, with the Alliance as well, continuing to, to be that catalyst to push things forward is going to be really huge. But I, I, it seems like a totally different place for that around the world now than even a few years ago. So yeah. let's hope it's the same statement in three years, I would think, for versus right now. Let's keep pushing. So I distinctly remember at this panel uh, in 2019 in Perth where uh, you were talking about platform trials and someone interrupted Kaldip and asked him to explain what a platform trial was in 2019. Of course now, here we are three years later, much more familiar and there's three platform trials around the world. But I, I, my understanding is that there's pros and cons to platform trials and, and individual trials and I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and what you see the future is. Well, I directed at you David. because you didn't know, because you had to answer it before. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll go. Um, uh, so maybe as a setting, baseline setting here, a platform trial essentially is where you are running uh, multiple therapies in a trial at the same time. Uh, and what that helps with is that you save time, you save cost. From an operation standpoint, it's easy because it's running one trial, but with five therapies or four therapies instead of one trial with one therapy. And so you get that operational efficiency. And so there are platform trials happening both here in the United States, but in Europe. Uh, and, uh, and there's one more, right? This, Scotland. This, Scotland, right. Yeah. So, um, so that's what Kathy's asking about. So I just want to uh, define that first. In terms of pros and cons, I think, uh, you know, I mean, the pros are that you are quickly testing these therapies. And we need to shut the door if they don't work. And, and that's what, I mean, look at the platform trial in, in the US. We funded it in 2019, which is when it got started. If somebody told me that in three years we would have the first four therapies tested and have an answer on, I, I wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> uh, and so that, that was the intent, which is to rapidly get to the answer, whether it works or it doesn't. And, and you know, the platform trial is not supposed to be the, the last stage. If there is something there, it will then allow you to to do a follow-on study, but if there isn't, you, you can quickly shut the door on that target or that hypothesis or that therapeutic, which has happened, by the way, for a couple of the uh, therapies in, in the platform trial. So I think, I think those are the pros. Um, I don't know if there are cons. I mean, what I would suggest the Healy trial at least do uh, better going forward would be the type of therapies that are getting evaluated and uh, entered into the trial. Not, again, I'm not you know, pointing a finger at anyone in there, but I'm just saying I think, I think looking at the validation of that target, the, you know, David and I talked about this yesterday about ataxin 2, how, how uh, strong is the target biology? Um, what's the, tr how tractable is that? target, what's the liability? I know that those questions are being asked. I'm not part of that committee, but I think, I think some of that will help in the selection of the next stage of therapies that come into, come into the HELI trial. I think there's also a question which takes us into probably a bigger question about the length of the, the trial length as well. And um, I mean, obviously, the HELI trial uses six months and measures ALS, FRS as the primary outcome. And the question is, is, is that long enough to get a, a, a definitive answer? Um, which is a, a, probably a wider question for a lot of clinical trials at the moment. So, but then you probably lose the, the efficiency of the trial model if you move to 12 months. So 
it, it's a challenge I think that people are, are now wrestling with, I assume, yeah. as they move these trials to the next stages. Yeah, uh, can I, sorry, to, just to add to what Gethin said, think about ALS, it's taken decades for it to develop. Um, and the, the damage that happens, and at least the hypothesis is that you get a 50% loss of neurons before you even start to see symptoms. And now we're expecting a drug to work through a pathway and reverse that in six months. So I, I do think that this idea around, you know, is the length, yes, efficiency is good. And what I said earlier, we want to shut the door if something's not working. But, you know, I always worry about how many drugs we are throwing out because you know, we didn't give it enough time for it to work against the biology. So it, it you know, it's a, it's a balance. Adriana, did you have thoughts yeah. there? Yeah. Uh, the, no, well, platforms have, have another pros, which is the use of a single uh, placebo group uh, against all the drugs. So this is very important for, obviously, for, uh, for patients because they have the possibility to receive drug much more than uh, with single uh, um, clinical trials. Uh, but I absolutely agree. Six months uh, uh, is is not enough to to see the effect of a drug of, of most of them. Um, and if we think the bi biology, uh, uh, the regeneration of a nerve um, needs uh, one, uh, does one millimeter per day. So you need uh, for for uh, reinnervation of a muscle about six months. So in any case. Uh, uh, six months is too, too long, uh, a short period to have an effect and reverse of the death of the, pay, uh, of the neurons on any way of the uh, reinnervation of muscles. Um, and uh, this has been demonstrated clearly with, uh, with the um, Tofersen, but also with uh, Relivrio. If you look at the, at the survival in Relivrio, you see that the difference starts to be after six months, so very late. Uh, there, there is a, a, an effect on LSFRS um, in the, the first part, but the real effect is uh, after six months. So uh, it was a really uh, good thing that uh, it appeared to be significant after, after six months, but it, we can say that uh, they were very fortunate about that. So uh, six months is something that uh, probably should be modified. I know that patients are not happy about that, but if you use a few placebo, then you can go and have more, more uh, longer, longer trials. The only other thing I would add is the flexibility to some extent with the shared placebo does make it sometimes difficult for if you want to have an ASO or something like that on there, it could be harder mm -hmm. to build that into an existing structure of a platform trial. Right. So um, that, yeah. That's a small con, but it's just, I think it is one to some extent. Make flexibility. Uh, question, whoever's got the mic. So, Toss Cochran from Biogen. Um, Gethin, you, you mentioned uh, in your opening remarks that, that David's done a, a really nice job of navigating the, the public discussion of science and, um, and has taken some heat, including some you know, very personal uh, attacks uh, along the way, um, but, but did it very elegantly. It prompts the question for me, sort of, I, I wonder if we could have a little bit of public discussion about what the role of advocacy organizations is in discussing the science, and what should the stance be um, in, in engaging the public on, on the science? Is it, is it full neutrality? Is it, you know, robust analyses of, you know, individual studies and the data? Is it somewhere in between? Um, I'm just interested in, in people's thoughts. And Kathy, maybe, maybe I'm interested in your thoughts on that as well. Um, well, I'll just start. I mean, I think this is why we have the SAC. So we, we have a, um, a wide range of experience and skill sets on the um, SAC from right around the world. So we have different um, sort of perspectives. And the discussions are pretty robust when we're discussing some of the um, our briefing notes, and we try to put those out as a, as a guideline. They try to be measured, and they will have probably less opinion, but the, the facts are presented. And I think I'm not sure whether, uh, if it's the Alliance's role to actually present uh, a strong opinion on 
uh, whether we think a drug should be approved or because we, we, we're often not party to all the data. Um, we don't see what the FDA sees. Um, so I, uh, I think we can only go on what we see, you know, that if there's a briefing note, uh, um, you know, a press release. Um, so we're often looking at, you know, a snapshot of the, of the data. Um, so I think um, uh, it's, uh, I'm not really uh, giving you a, a, an answer there, but it, it's, uh, I think we should stick to, I think we should stick to the facts. Basically, yeah. In the public, uh, I think Tass, you were asking about sort of the public discourse around science, and you know, I, I you know, credit goes to David for for being for taking that uh, sort of incoming. Um, but you know, no one should be subjected to that. Uh, we're scientists. We're you know, we're not in this corner or that corner, uh, and. Um, you know, I've seen some of the comments that have been directed, some death threats and things like that. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Um, you know, we're, we're here doing our jobs day in and day out, and the, you know, we're looking at the science the same way that everybody else is looking at the science. What I would say is, from an advocacy organization standpoint, we are advocates for pa patients, and so we're already inherently biased because we want everything to work. And so what, what you want is independent evaluation of the, of the data. Um, so you know, Adriano, who is you know, not working for a uh, patient or advocacy organization, is better equipped to look at that data. Uh, not that David and Gethin and I can't do science. We can. We can look at the paper. And we can. But we are also coming with a patient advocacy hat that we're wearing. And we want everything to succeed. <laughs> and so it, it is important to have that kind of independent evaluation. I think Adriana wants everything to succeed. <laughs> I, mean, I feel like you do. You must. No, that, that's, that's a point because in, in our, when we, are, uh, we have our meetings, we do such discussion. There are uh, several neurologists in the group. And I think that's important because we can uh, exchange freely our opinion uh, and uh, to find, uh, I would say, a sort of compromise between the, the, the within science and uh, the organization. I, I know that patient organizations are sort of trade unions because they, that's their, their work they have to do. Uh, but I also understand that most of them try to be uh, um, uh, correct in the interpretation of the, of the trials. And uh, when we have that, um, and we say that we have doubt about some, some drugs, I feel that the same doubt are on the, uh, on the group of the organization. So uh, patient organization can, can be uh, more independent than uh, you think, probably, um, if there is a good discussion with, uh, with the scientist. Can, can I actually, can I take off of that for one second? Because it comes from a very pure place of, I got pushed online for, and I'm not, I shouldn't just talk about myself, but everyone else did first, so I guess I'm just gonna, but like I got pushed sort of to go online from people in the community. And they said there needs to be someone out there talking about it. And I thought, well, this is, I'm not a social media person. This isn't my thing. But it, I, I also have, I, I have a luxury and an honor and all of this to, to be connected to so many people. And then the SAC role has helped me with that as well. So I get to ask Adriano and I get to ask Leonard Vandenberg and I get to ask all the Canadian clinicians and I get to ask all the American clinicians through all of the things that I go to what their opinions are and kind of try to come to some sort of middle recipe and push back if I have an opinion on them, not on formulating my own opinions publicly. And then just trying to distill that a little bit out to people because I have that privilege and they don't. They don't have the privilege to speak to Adriano in a way that it could just be a quick email and say, what do you think of this? And so that's all that it really comes from as a pure place of being a conduit in a place that's difficult. And to be honest, the time that every, all these clinicians spend doing all the different volunteer work and the work that they do and everything, to be online, there's just no time for it. So it just comes from that simple place of no opinion in the end other than trying to figure out what the, consent, the academic consensus is. And this is my hopeful distilling of that. Hi, Andrea, over here. Hey, Andrea. First of all, it's really been an honor to work with all of you the last year. So kudos to all the hard work. Um, 
I want to ask a question, take this in a bit of a different direction. There's been a lot of push recently with respect to pre-symptomatic ALS carriers. And so I think there, there's a spectrum sort of, of of where people feel that folks who are known carriers should have access to therapy, should have access to expanded access programs. Um, can you maybe discuss some of the pros and cons of that? Who wants to stop? I think Adriano's very equipped for that. Sure. If he's willing. I mean, Did you hear the question, Adriano? Uh, well, but, uh, Presymptomatic are uh, persons that carry, carry a genetic mutation. So they could uh, have ALS in the future because we know that all genes have a different penetrance. Not all patients, not, not all subjects that have the gene, uh, um, the mutation will develop ALS during life. So these are perfect people in any case uh, to be treated uh, in advance uh, with, uh, with uh, a drug, a, a possibly effective drug. People who are not uh, caring um, are not uh, uh, a good target for the therapy. And uh, on the other side, a presymptomatic is a person with a non-genetic mutation. Uh, a person that is not affected by LS, is not genes, uh, is in any case a person that has uh, a very low probability to, to develop ALS because ALS remains a rare disease overall. So um, I think that uh, the uh, currently, we cannot do anything for um, the general population to prevent ALS unless they have genetic mutations. We know that there are some environmental factors, but they are too, not, so, not so strong to be considered useful for uh, in, uh, um, uh, selecting people to, uh, to start uh, um, therapies uh, without any, any symptom. And I think also at the moment, I mean, yes, we've got the ATLAS trial happening, which will be the first example of such an approach. But um, at the moment, what, what treatments would you provide to people in the pre-symptomatic state? I mean, we really only have Riliazole and uh, Idarovone. Um, obviously, Relvio is out there now, but we have no, uh, do we have any idea how effective that's going to be long term? Is there going to be a toxicity further down the road? Is, is the risk, I guess, of giving it to potentially healthy people uh, of a, a, a drug that may cause harm rather than good? I, I don't know. I mean, um, we need that biomarker, a really reliable biomarker, that when it goes up, that's a signal that you can start treating. And will that be NFL? Um, I think, again, that's what Atlas, the Atlas trial may tell us. I don't, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I mean, we may not have drugs right now to prescribe to asymptomatic carriers, but there are prevention things that we could do. And this is what we have been pushing the CDC to do. You know, they've been funding prevention risk factors for, for many years. And you know, for scientists, you know, we want more and more validation. But we already have some candidate risk factors, or we already have some ideas around, hey, you know, if if ALS runs in your family, perhaps you shouldn't be playing for the National Football League because you know we know that the NFL study showed uh, you know that um, you know football players were sixfold higher risk of getting uh, uh, ALS. And so, you know, there are. I, I'm I'm using that as an idea, but point is that I think we can start to develop some guidelines. Uh, on what that ki kind of prevention would look like. You know, if you, if you are a high risk, this is the whole Amar al Chalabi hypothesis that there are six hits and, you know, you get, e eventually you get to those hits and you get, you get the disease. And if we can maybe, you know, tamp down those hits or take those out completely, uh, then, then we could help the symptom asymptomatic carriers to not get symptomatic. Uh, and so, you know, there are things, and I, I agree with Gethin on the biomarker piece. I mean, if we can understand what that phenol conversion is when someone who is asymptomatic gene carrier becomes symptomatic, if we know what that happens during that phenol conversion period, I think that could help us tremendously. I think, as, as you were saying earlier, this is the first neurodegenerative disease where they've actually got a preventative trial. Right. I think that's what... Called it was saying it hasn't happened in Parkinson's, it hasn't happened in dementia, so right. an MS. Can I, can uh, I sorry, 
Oh, sorry, please. This is happening for, uh, also in uh, MSA. Oh, in SMA. In SMA, SMA, they are doing exactly the same. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that gene is a very strong gene. If you have uh, a deletion, you, have, you are going to have the disease without, without any yeah. doubt. But about phenotype, uh, um, if, you, if we look to other diseases, for, for example, Parkinson disease, they have some presymptomatic signs, um, and, uh, problems in the smell, uh, problems in, the, in sleeping, and so on. But anyway, they are trying to use uh, these uh, symptoms uh, to um, start preventive therapy, um, but that they are not so strong to be able to um, select patients. And on the other side, they have uh, in, a, in, a, in Parkinson's disease, they, they have no preventive therapy at all. So uh, even if there are some particular phenotypes that can be used in Parkinson, they are not so strong. In, in ALS, we have not um, found any phenotype of this type in uh, the presymptomatic. Probably the only one is uh, the, um, the, the weight of the patient, the, um, the, um, uh, some data about weight. But again, these are not very strong. Yeah. Could, yeah. And can I, could I just add that? Like, I, I, Jean Swidler is a person online who says a lot of things like this, and she's thinking about this constantly. And it's, it's something that I, I mean, honestly, I empathize, like I think about this, and I'm and, and glad there's still people pushing on that. Because when someone has a family history of a, of a say, a C9R72, mutation and they're saying, well, why can't I access really is all why can't I access a Daravone? And and we say, look, it's really complicated upstream of diagnosis on how to understand the underlying biology of C9RF72. All I'm trying to say is that I can understand that question. I don't have an answer for it, but I'm glad that people are still pushing that button to help push us to say we need to figure it out. And so um, yeah, it's something every time she mentions I think. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know the answer, but I appreciate the question. Uh, well, I, this I, is Lauren, Lauren Webb from uh, Last Turner ALS Foundation. Um, one of the, I just attended a palliative care um, training, and, and one of the core principles of serious illness care is minimizing regret. And so I've been like, for the past two weeks, that's all I've been thinking about is minimizing regret within terms of clinical trials. And, you know, over the years, having more and more patient involvement and engagement in the design and the re recruitment and retention, I think has contributed greatly. But I think the, one of the missing pieces is um, explaining results. Um, explaining where we're actually at in the science in, in ways that we can understand. And I think that that can help take down some of that, that noise um, and, uh, and help support and, and really, you know, this is critical. You know, it's not just this abstract and it's felt on a very emotional level. Um, and people aren't, you know, so it needs to be balanced and presented in a way that, that is easily digestible. And, you know, when, when uh, you know, Tammy was talking about uh, budgeting for advocacy. I think budgeting for medical writers, you know, who can write in, in a way could help alleviate the burden on some of these, you know, smaller organizations that don't have that, that capability to help translate the work that you guys do in your, your uh, bulletins. So we just need to make them more light. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think, um, and also encouraging our researchers and to as well to spend more time trying to communicate their research, but as well as the clinical trial data, I think there should be a lot of, um, it should be a, a requirement of any yeah. anyone running a clinical trial that they have to uh, explain, spend a lot of time communicating the results. I, I agree it should be done more. I think, yeah, I, think. I mean, and Niels gives you the opportunity to do that, right? I mean, Amelix did this really well when their centroid results came out, Sabrina Paganoni, went on the Niels webinar and gave an hour long presentation on the data and what it meant. And that was patient facing uh, presentation. And so, you know, there are opportunities like that that Niels and other organizations provide. I, I think organizations should t do it, even if it's a negative trial. Um, you know, Alexion is an example. We, we you know, if after it was negative in the Healy trial, we didn't kind of hear anything more about it. And, you know, not pointing to a you know, single company, but just giving an example of this. Even if it's a negative study, I think taking time to kind of say, this were the data, this is what happened, 
this is where we are, and this is why we're no longer pursuing the program. E even something like that is really helpful. I, we know there are trials that are done, for example, you know, we haven't heard from Copper ATSM in a long time. Um, you know, what's happening with them? What are the results? And we shouldn't have to wait for a publication uh, to come out, which, you know, we all know it can take years. Uh, a company can easily have a, you know, work with Niels or some organization like that to, you know, to do a webinar and, and, and show the data. I'd also be really interested in your opinion, Lauren, actually, like uh, afterwards to help us think about that as well. So just as a friend from pharma, Coldup's point is really important, but to the patient advocacy groups in the room, please email us or ask for that information. If you don't ask for it, we can't often compliantly provide it. So sorry to say the burden is to ask a little bit, but we do need to be reactive. <laughs> Um, as you all know, uh, I don't have any background in research, um, more funding, but it was part of uh, the SAC. Um, I always wonder why there are still two organizations like FDA and EMA, and now we're talking about three platforms, um, the Healy, the M&D Smart, and the Tricals. So for people like me that I don't understand research, I don't get why we have all this multiple platforms and organizations, is there something we can do on a worldwide scale um, to proceed to have one platform? Is it a good idea or is it a bad idea? What are your opinions about that? Hey, hang on, when you say platform, you're saying one regulatory agency. No, so I have or so one two, platform sort of two one platform trial. I have, one, I, have, I have one wish, that there will be one regulatory worldwide. If, is that possible? And the other one is, if we have three platforms, like the Healy, the m and Smart, and the Tricals, for me it's always difficult if there's, they're probably all as good as the other ones. So why is there not one that we can share? And are, are they sharing information? I don't know. I know the Tricals because I'm in Europe, but maybe the other ones are better, or are they sharing things? What are your thoughts upon those two things? Adriano is a big part of Tricals, and so he probably would be really equipped to talk about what he gets from Healy and Smart? Well, well as usual, the, the presence of different uh, groups working on, on ALS uh, has created different uh, different platforms. Uh, that, that's, uh, it, it's not really a problem because the platforms are not in, not in competition. We are doing different trials sometimes, and we have also um, uh, a, a trial that is, is in common, for example, the, the last uh, uh, the Phoenix trial, which is the last Amelix trial, uh, is incumbent between the two platforms, so we can do that. Um, to have a single uh, um, uh, authority is probably uh, impossible if we have not a, a single government in the world, because we are going to have a lot of authority. For example, UK is uh, separating from uh, EMA, and now is, is going to have another authority, and uh, Canada is another one, uh, it's not the same in the US. Um, and this is also related to the fact that we have different regulation, different levels of, uh, of uh, evaluation of, of drugs. Um, and uh, these are also related to the difference that we have in Europe and in particular in the US about the uh, health system. Because in Europe, it is a, a, a national, usually a national health system. So all drugs that uh, have, um, are approved, they are uh, immediately paid for by the government. This not happen in the US because in the US the drugs are paid by insurances or out of um, uh, the pocket by the patients. So th there is a different level of approval uh, related to that. In Europe, um, the, uh, the authority must be more sure about the results of a, of a drug than in the US probably. And so we see the difference that we are looking now, uh, for example, in the Arab one, which is not approved in Europe and is approved in the US. I think perhaps that's a role where the International Alliance can come in to try and help at least have some normalization of those different standards or, or you know, the 12 months at EMA, six months at the FDA. It would be good if we can like, at least gather people together to try and perform a consensus and then 
that provide that as advice to the, the various regulatory agencies to at least, they may not all sort of accept the same, um, uh, each other's um, decisions, but at least perhaps they'll make the decisions based on similar, uh, similar information, which would probably help and would certainly help the drug companies, I'm sure. Hi. My question is about competent drugs. Like, we all know it is a multiple pathological problem. And we are expecting one drug to all the problems. Instead, if we uh, look at combination uh, therapy, like uh, we have a gene therapy uh, to find, we can have a stem cell uh, therapy, like not all, and maybe by combining, we can get a better outcome. Now, the two companies are not going to come together because they have their own mechanism. So how can we do this as an alliance? Do you want me to start? It's up to you. you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, so the question was around combination therapies. And you know, now that we have three approved, at least in the United States, um, this is a topic that we have, the association has been thinking about quite a bit. Um, you know, we, we now have Rilizol and Oral Radicava and Rilibrio, and if we could do a real-world evidence study, I talked about this at Niels, um, where we're looking at prospectively, um, you know, and I don't know who, maybe Adriana wants to do this study, but, uh, you know, where you use you have people on different combinations, right? We don't know if Rilizol and Relivrio together is gonna have a better effect on respiratory distress or falls or the number of times you have to go to urgent care or emergency rooms. Um, what's happening to the outcomes uh, with these combination therapies? That needs to be looked at. We have an opportunity now. There are three drugs um, and we just need to be able to do a, a phase four study to look at, you know, which combinations of these, or do you need all three? I mean, think about the HIV field from two decades ago when, you know, it was a death sentence and, and so on. And today there are, you know, two dozen treatments and a person with HIV, it's a livable disease. Yes, they have to take, you know, multiple, multiple treatments and but they're all working in combination in some way to have a, a better impact. And that's what we want for ALS. That's what we mean by livable. So um, I, I agree with that, that I think that's sort of the next stage is to look at uh, combinations of these three drugs that we have on market already to try to see what it does. Adriano, you were shaking your head. Yeah. No, <laughs> I, I agree. But um, by the way, um, Relivero was studied with, with Rilusol because 70% right. of patients had Rilusol. So we, we know something about that. Uh, th there are some initiatives by the regulatory authorities for doing something similar. Uh, it is, it's uh, the initiative uh, that is called Real World Evidence. Uh, and it's something that could be... Uh, it's not really clear at the moment because it's something that is going to be done, um, but is to use all data we have uh, for registries or what else uh, in order to understand the, the, uh, both the possibility of uh, problems or side effects or combinations, but uh, most importantly, the, the effect, the clinical effect. And probably we have some, some chance if uh, the uh, FDA and EMA will proceed in that way uh, to um, uh, organize some uh, of these studies. We, they will be absolutely very interesting because I think that ALS has several mechanisms. And so we have to, um, to have target uh, and drugs on different targets to have a possibly a real important effect on uh, sporadic ALS. There's another thing from the Alliance, real world evidence. Yes. Definitely. Collaborative real-world evidence generation, Kathy. I um, had one more uh, comment. Am I guessing our time is up? One more question? Okay. Do we have a question? So I had a 
uh, just a bit of a comment, I guess, and this follows up on what you were saying from Gort Jan's comment about one regulator. I think what we saw with Canada coming first with Albrioza was that that kind of pulled the U.S. along. And it's a bit of a market economy at that point where we get this push-pull in certain places. And a concern, and this is provocative given that I'm chairing the advocacy committee too, but if we were to have one regulator, we might end up more on the side of conservative than on a risk taker. And so in fact, it could potentially set us back further because they're not likely to come to the other side. And so I, I, I don't know that what we have is right, but I don't know that those options are right either. And so that's something that we've been looking at because there have been other models that have been proposed that have that alignment. Well, what would have happened right now with the EMA and the FDA if they were having to come to a common consensus to be able to support or not support? a drug going through regulatory approval. So I like the real world evidence piece, but I'm curious about that when I think further forward about where we might go. I think the rationalization of criteria though would still be important. Perhaps not every organization can still make up their own mind on whether to approve something, but they should all be doing it on, a, on similar criteria, I think would, would simplify the process. But I agree, possibly some appetite for risk may vary. And as Adriana was saying, there's obviously different financial implications for different mm -hmm. countries depending on your, 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 your system as well. Hi, I've got the microphone back here in the right-hand corner, the other way. Um, I, Michelle Manuel from Amelix Pharmaceuticals. I want to comment on real-world evidence. We're already following real-world evidence in Canada through the Canadian Neuromuscular Disease Registry, so we have a partnership with the University of Calgary. We are looking at people who were in our special access program while um, Albrios was under review in Canada. And also, if, as people you know, take, take Albrioza following them, so we're looking at every region where we have people on drug to look at sources of real-world evidence. And they're wide and varied. There are health claims, there are uh, disease registries, et cetera. So we do have plans to partner with academic centers. We know that having a sponsor say, we're going to set up a registry and we're going to follow these patients is, is not credible. So we are going to work with academic centers to follow these um, people who are on Relivrio slash Albrioza in combination, not in combination, et cetera, so that it will be ongoing. Can I just say that we didn't say probably enough that pharma is such a huge partner in all of this mm -hmm. and will drive a lot of these things, uh, both financially and just as a partner with academia in a way that is incredibly important, I think, for all of the questions today. Um, so thank you for highlighting that. And, and Michelle, there's Natural History Consortium, there's the MDA's Mover uh, Initiative. There are already existing initiatives where prospective uh, people with ALS can be followed uh, you know, on these various combinations of therapies. So I'm glad, I'm glad to hear it. And I've got the mic here, Pablo, not to make your job any harder. Right well, here, no. center. No problem. <laughs> As you're trying to, but I did want to make one comment off of what Tammy just said and, and what Gorion was talking about earlier about the regulators is that uh, the International Alliance has been trying to bring together the regulators um, to a conversation, to a common table over this past year. We hosted a couple of different roundtables in which we invited uh, representatives from FDA and EMA. We haven't had success yet. I think part of that was because we were in the height of what's hap happening with Emelix and all those different pieces, but I think that will probably be a role that the Alliance will see itself in trying to convene the conversations. And uh, Tammy, I agree with you, and I do have the same concern about falling on the, the side of conservative approaches, and I, and I know that you and I worked together quite a bit over this last year to try to push FDA into different directions, but really where the the alliance is seen, I think, is trying to convene the conversation so that whether it's clinical trial design and making sure that it would pass muster for, for, the, for any of the agencies or trying to look at what those access barriers might be. So I just wanted to, to put that out there as so that's a conversation that has been happening quite a lot for the past 12, 18 months or so. Well, thank you. I think that's all the time we have. It's very hard for me to stop this conversation. It was really <laughs> meaty and juicy. So thank you so much. Uh, that was very interesting, very important. We needed to talk about these things. And I want to thank David for all your work. Please don't go too far. OK, <laughs> don't leave us <laughs> too soon. But thank you for all your wonderful work.
as, a, as the chair of the SAC. And welcome, Gethin, to your new job. Thank you, Nara. <laughs> and please join me in thanking the SAC. Thank you, Adriano, for being there. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Adriano.